Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today I'm presenting priority-based parameter propagation for distributed deep neural network training. And uh, this is a collaborative project between uh, UBC, CMU, Vector Institute, and University of Toronto. So let me start by giving you an overall uh, summary of this entire work. So as you all know, data parallel training is a popular strategy for scaling deep neural network training on a, on a large cluster. But the problem is uh, the performance benefits are highly bounded by the communication-heavy parameter synchronization operation. Uh, in this work, we make this key observation that the parameter synchronization can be scheduled better to reduce the communication overhead by taking advantage of the domain-specific uh, knowledge that we have about the training algorithm. So based on this observation, we uh, propose a new parameter synchronization mechanism called priority-based parameter propagation, or simply called P3. So P3 implements two key op optimization. First one is parameter slicing, which synchronizes parameters at a finer granularity. And second one is priority-based uh, update, which, is, uh, which synchronizes parameters based on their priority. And with P3, we managed to improve the training uh, performance of VGG19 by as much as 66%, uh, a sequence-to-sequence -sequence based model, Sokai, by 38%, and Resonant 50 by 25%. Uh, next, let me give you a little bit of background and motivation for this work. So neural network training on a single GPU is extremely time consuming. Uh, these are four uh, different uh, machine learning models and their corresponding training time on a single P100 GPU. So as you can see, the training time takes about uh, tens of hours to days or sometimes even weeks to finish. And this happens because of three key reasons. First one is the high degree of computational complexity associated with the training algorithm. Uh, second one is the training algorithm has to tune large number of training parameters, usually of the order of hundreds of millions or even billions. And finally, and most importantly, the algorithm has to process large data sets to achieve reasonable accuracy. Now, fortunately, the training algorithm is highly data parallel and can be taken advantage of and then scale on larger cluster and improve the training performance. So one of the most common methods uh, used in, uh, to implement data parallel training is to use parameter server architecture with synchronous HGD algorithm. So in this paradigm, there are multiple workers uh, training a shared neural network, and uh, the large data set is equally distributed among these worker machines. So during the training process, each worker machines compute gradients for, for the parameters in the neural network by sampling input from their own data shards. And then they synchronize these parameter updates by sending the gradients to the parameter server. Parameter server then aggregates these gradients and updates the parameters using optimization algorithm like stochastic gradient descent. And then finally broadcast this update, updated parameters back to the worker machines. Now the problem with this approach is the uh, parameter synchronization, especially sending gradients to the parameter server and receiving the updated parameters back usually has to go through a network, which is extremely communication-heavy operation. So just to give you a sense, it takes about, on an average, hundreds of megabytes that need to be transferred on every few hundreds of milliseconds. So because of that, the performance benefits out of data parallel training is highly bounded uh, on this parameter synchronization step. So next, we, uh, we uh, conducted a case study on a popular machine learning uh, framework, MXNet. And we trained ResNet 50 on a four machine cluster, each with P4000 GPU. And we measured the training throughput while artificially limiting the network bandwidth. So in this graph, uh, it's a bandwidth versus uh, training throughput graph. And as you can see, the training throughput start to drop from six GBPS onwards. And it drops by more than 25% at four GBPS. So this means the training throughput suffers uh, drastically if the network bandwidth is insufficient. Now, at the same time, if you look at the network utilization graph at this point, the, the network stays idle 20 to 30 percent of the time. This means even though the network bandwidth was insufficient for training, the framework ended up underutilizing the network and then pays more penalty on the training throughput. Next, we uh, analyzed the network utilization of heavier models, uh, for example, VGG19. So in this graph, you can see uh, the network is still idle considerable amount of the time during the training. But on top of that, the inbound and outbound traffic are not overlapped very well. Uh, this means the bidirectional bandwidth is not efficiently utilized. 
And uh, in order to understand why this happens, uh, let me give you a little bit of background about uh, how parameter synchronization is actually implemented in these modern machine learning frameworks. So uh, frameworks like uh, MXNet and TensorFlow, they try to uh, reduce the communication overhead by overlapping communication with the computation. The way they do is by uh, taking advantage of the layered structure of the neural network. And uh, you can see how the communication and computation is overlapped in the timeline graph. So the bottom row, I'll, I'll show the computation trees. And the top three rows, uh, I'll show the communication trees with respect to individual layers. So during backward propagation, which starts at the final layer, and it progresses to the, the second layer. So while computing the gradient for the second layer, uh, the frameworks issue synchronization for the previous layer, which is L3, by sending the gradients to the parameter server. And this continues uh, to the first layer as well. So uh, while computing the gradients of first layer, uh, framework sends the gradients for the second layer. But at the same time, uh, it receives the updated parameters for the first, uh, third layer. And this happens until the parameters for the first layer has updated. And once this is done, uh, we can start the next iteration by issuing the forward propagation. So as you can see, by doing this, uh, method of parameter synchronization, you can overlap the com communication mostly with the uh, backward propagation. And the delay between the two iterations uh, is only limited by the synchronization for the first layer. But in this work, we make this key observation that this type of synchronization is not suitable for many neural networks. So our first key observation is regarding the underutilization of bidirectional bandwidth, and we propose a solution called pa parameter slicing. So if you look at the heavy models like VGG19, uh, this is the parameter distribution graph of uh, VGG19 uh, layer index uh, versus number of parameters on each layer. So you can see there is one single layer which contains more than 70% of the parameters in the whole neural network. So because of the presence of such considerably heavy layers, the parameter synchronization actually is dominated by that particular layer. So uh, let me go back to that three-layer neural network example. And in this case, the, layer, the second layer, L2, takes thrice as much time to synchronize parameters compared to uh, first and third layer. So because of that, uh, during the highlighted time periods, uh, the traffic flows only in one direction. That means the, 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 other, the other direction, the network stays idle. So this is weighted network uh, bandwidth that we can actually utilize to improve the communication overhead. So in order to solve this, we propose a solution called parameter slicing. Uh, the idea is to uh, slice the layer into smaller pieces and then synchronize uh, each slice independent to each other. So by doing so, as you can see, the, the layer two is split into three equal pieces and synchronize them independently. So the, uh, the inbound and outbound traffic are perfectly overlapped. And the communication between the, sorry, the delay between the two iterations has reduced by more than 30%. Next observation is regarding the uh, uh, network idle time that we observed in the graphs, and we propose a solution called priority-based update. So if you look at the uh, parameter distribution of uh, image classification models like Resident 50, so there is an uh, uneven parameter distribution in this graph, uh, in the sense that the initial layers are light, usually lighter convolution layers, and the final layers are heavier, uh, fully connected layers. So because of this, uh, because of this uneven distribution, the final layer takes too much time to communicate compared to the initial ones. So as you can see in this timeline graph, uh, during backward propagation, uh, we issue the synchronization for the final layer in first, and then uh, progresses towards the initial layers. So because it takes too much time to communicate, it can in induce additional queuing delay onto the lighter initial layers. And it can further delay the next iteration. So in this example, uh, the last two layers, L3 and L2, takes twice as much time to uh, synchronize compared to the lighter initial layer, L1. So because of that, even though the gradients for L1 was computed much earlier, the parameter synchronization for that layer has to be delayed until the network gets freed up. On top of that, uh, yeah, so the delay between the two iterations has increased. So on top of that, uh, during forward propagation, the network stays completely idle. So this is the uh, idle time that you're observing in the network utilization graphs. 
Now, if you look at the per layer communication overhead, the initial layer is L1. Uh, the, the gradients for L1 is computed at the end of the backward propagation and is immediately consumed at the beginning of the next forward propagation. So it's very critical to synchronize parameters of L1 as soon as possible. But at the same time, for final layers, we can afford much higher communication delay. So in this example, uh, L3, uh, the, the gradients for L3 is computed at the end of the, uh, sorry, at the beginning of the backward propagation and is only consumed at the end of the forward, forward propagation. So based on this observation, we assign priorities to each layer. So the initial layers get the highest priority and it decreases moving towards the end of the neural network and the, the final layer gets the lowest priority. And after that, we synchronize the parameters based on this priority of layers. So we always allocate the network cycles for the highest priority, the currently available highest priority layer. And by doing so, uh, the communication is evenly overlapped with both backward and forward propagation. And also the delay between two iterations has reduced by more than half. So to summarize, uh, uh, yeah, so basically, yeah, uh, the iteration time is considerably reduced because of this uh, even overlap between communication and computation. So based on these two optimizations, we propose uh, a new parameter synchronization mechanism called P3, or uh, priority-based parameter propagation, which is a combination of parameter slicing optimization and priority-based update. And we implemented P3 on top of MXNet by modifying the, the KV store module and which took only like about uh, 200 lines of code change. And uh, P3 is open source, and if you want to uh, know more about the implementation part, you can attend the poster session or you can read the paper. So we evaluated uh, P3, uh, uh, we compared P3 against uh, MXNet version 1.1 as the main baseline, and we used uh, two image classification models, VGG19 and Resident 50, and uh, one LSTM-based model, Sokai, as the main benchmark. And in the evaluations, we use uh, training throughput as the main evaluation metric. Now, according to MLPF standard, the uh, ideal evaluation metric should be the, uh, the, the time to achieve a certain accuracy. But in this case, we can afford to use uh, training throughput because both baseline and P3 always sends the full gradients and they follow the same training curve. And we conducted this experiment in two different setups. So first one is uh, on a private cluster on a tightly controlled environment uh, where we have four machines and each equipped with a four P4000 GPU and uh, interconnected with 100 Gbps InfiniBand. And we also conducted experiments on uh, real world uh, like uh, cloud-based clusters, uh, which is uh, AWS G3.4x class machines. So the first experiment is to measure the training throughput and uh, we, uh, we conducted this experiment in two steps. So the first one is to analyze how if, uh, the, the benefits out of parameter slicing optimization alone. And uh, uh, as you can see, we get about 50% improvement on uh, VGG19 uh, on, top of, uh, on top of the baseline performance. And uh, with full P3, which, which incorporates both parameter slicing and priority-based update optimization, the uh, performance benefits has uh, increased to up to 66%. Uh, we, we see similar uh, observations in uh, other models like Sokai as well. Uh, with parameter slicing, we, uh, we get about 30% uh, improvement our baseline, and with P3, it further increased to about 38%. And uh, for ResNet 50, with P3, we get 25% improvement. Now, it's interesting that we don't see much uh, benefits from parameter slicing optimization alone in this case. Uh, the main reason is ResNet 50 is a comparatively lighter model, and there is no disproportionately heavy uh, layer which could dominate the parameter synchronization and uh, uh, underutilize the bidirectional bandwidth. So as I explained, the uh, P3 actually uh, improves the uh, communication overhead by uh, better utilizing the available network bandwidth. So this is an example of uh, training of Sokai on the same four machine cluster. So you can see compared to baseline, P3 is utilizing the network bandwidth more efficiently and the both incoming and outgoing traffic are efficiently overlapped. So finally, we, uh, we measure the scalability of uh, P3 compared to baseline. 
Uh, this is done on an AWS cluster with uh, G3.4 large machines and uh, 10 GBPS network bandwidth. Uh, we measured this uh, training throughput by increasing the cluster size from 1 to 16. So as you can see, uh, P3 actually scales much better than baseline with about 61% more uh, performance compared to, compared to the baseline system. So we have more results on the paper. Uh, we compared P3 against uh, TensorFlow and Poseidon, which is like uh, state-of-the-art frameworks. And we also compared P3 against uh, uh, gradient compression techniques like uh, deep gradient compression, and also with uh, asynchronous HGD methods. So to conclude, uh, so in this work, we try to target uh, the communication overhead of parameter synchronization step and try to, uh, try to find ways to optimize that. And uh, based, on this, uh, based on this problem, we, we propose a new parameter synchronization mechanism called uh, P3, which implements two key optimizations. First one is parameter slicing, which synchronizes parameters at a uh, finer granularity than it's been done uh, right now. And uh, uh, we also, uh, uh, you know, uh, consider the priority of the layers and then synchronize them according to that, which is priority-based updates and uh, optimization. And with P3, we managed to get about 66% improvement over VGG19 and 38% uh, uh, improvement on uh, Sokai and 25% improvement on Rosen50. So finally, P3 source code is open, and uh, we have also validated the results uh, and the and the source code using a SysML artifact evaluation method. And if you want to reproduce the results, the instructions are available in the appendix of the paper. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Anand. Um, we're open for questions. If anyone has a question, please come up to the mics and ask your question. No questions? I'm going to have to ask a really hard question if you guys don't ask questions. So uh, this is Anusha from uh, NetApp. I was wondering, like, this priority, doesn't it need a lot of information about what model you are going to train, or is it independent, like, can work in generic fashion? Uh, okay, so there are... Uh, two ways to answer that question. So most of the neural network has this static computation graph. So you can actually do static analysis on top of this DAG and then uh, you know, uh, prepare this priority. But uh, some of the like, uh, modern neural networks contain dynamic control flows, and it's very difficult to do static analysis and compute the uh, you know, prioritization for all the layers. So, Currently, we do static analysis and prioritize the layers, but there's an interesting future work to do on dynamic control, uh, computation graphs. Thank yeah. you. Hi, uh, Leon from McKinsey. Uh, my first question would be, uh, so does your parameter slicing assume independence of the parameters? And also, uh, what's the impact of this approach on the classification rate versus a non-parameter slicing approach? Uh, impact on classification? So the actual classification rate, like the model performance. Uh, did you say classification? Uh, I, I can't hear. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah uh, so parameter slicing optimization actually uh, uh, is useful only for like heavy models that I shown, for uh, like uh, like VGG19 or Sokai, which contains like huge layers which can dominate this parameter uh, synchronization process. So the main advantage is coming from uh, utilizing both channels, the incoming and outgoing channels, at the same time, and pipelining the traffic really well. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. Dave Anderson, Carnegie Mellon. Um, so I'm curious about one thing, which is the previous talk showed that they were getting a performance speed up on ResNet, and you showed that the performance speed up kind of stopped on ResNet. Can you, st I realize you're only the author of one of these two papers, but can you speculate on why there's a difference? Uh, so for ResNet, uh, yeah. So as you can see in the in the graphs, uh, let me just pull that. This one, right? Yep. Yeah. So in this graph, uh, when you have enough bandwidth, like more than six Gbps, you have enough network bandwidth, and the communication is no longer the bottleneck. 
But if that and, that, and that totally matches my intuition, but I'm curious yes. because the previous paper showed that they were able to get training speed ups, at least in their TensorFlow parameter server thing, on ResNet. Yeah, I'm not sure what uh, experiments yeah. they have conducted and what, what was the like parameters used, but uh, this is uh, the results that we are getting. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Okay, um, any other questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker one more time.